all of us who covered the Balkans, we'd all had a moment of hope at some point. This is like a decade he'd been, more than a decade he'd been in power. And one of my colleagues, I was then working at the Independent, I can remember way back in 1990, before anything had begun, saying, oh, there were some elections, I think Milosevic is finished now. This was only like a year after his rise. And at different stages, each of us thought he'd almost gone. My particular moment was huge demonstrations in the winter of 96 to 97 and it was very similar atmosphere to Belgrade in 2000 and there was a tipping point there was a big retreat by the authorities where they gave way on some of the demonstrators demands and I absolutely felt we've made you know they have made it but in a sense we the world this this change was coming and then Milosevic clawed back power and came back that happened again and again and again so I like many others having been burned I arrived, although in a sense you felt that the election meant that he was surely bound to go now, there was enough groundswell against him. Um, and we were cooped up partly in Montenegro and then I managed to get into to Belgrade. Um, and it still felt as though he would cling on somehow by a mixture of the lies and the violence. And Maggie was there at the same same time. And you really felt he would play some game to, to cling on to power. So I had two little moments of thinking, oh my God, it really is over. The, one was the day before this. Um, with a colleague, we went down to uh, Milosevic's hometown, Pozharovac. Um, and there we met this guy in a cafe who had been beaten up by Milosevic's son, Marco, his, his thugs had beaten him up because he was an opposition type. And this guy met us in a cafe and he told us how I think that very morning or maybe the previous evening, Marco had come round and said, we can kind of be friends really, can't we? I mean, you know, this, yeah, some stuff happened, but this. So there was Marco, the son of Milosevic, trying to make up to the guy and clearly in Marco's mind, it was all over. So that was the first moment I thought, wow, this really is, and I wrote that story saying to my foreign editor, please give it space, because I really think this is something which is, uh, you know, for real. And then the second moment, where I can still remember with Serb friends, as you uh, described, lots of things I didn't remember from that piece, but I do remember we got up very early to go out to the mine. I hadn't been able to go out the previous day for a couple of other reasons. Um, so thought, well, even before the demonstration, we just must get out there. Got out at dawn, it was maybe an hour, an hour and a half out of town. <coughs> Went to see the miners, talked to them, talked to this, that and the other. Came back to the main road and all of us, there were three of us in the car, I guess, became kind of helpless with laughter. There was this convoy, we saw it here in the film, but it was even thicker traffic. And it really felt like kind of it was a Macbeth moment, you know, everything was coming to, to Dunsinane. <laughs> and you felt at that point, you thought it really can't. And there was this slightly hysterical atmosphere, I say two Serb friends and myself coming back and we had to go across fields. I desperately, of course, needed to file. So the driver managed fantastic back routes across muddy files because it was a traffic jam all the way from there to Belgrade. And we kept kind of going on the curb, going through fields, doing this, that and the other. So that entire journey, it was, it's completely over. What we didn't, of course, know, I mean, there was a joyous atmosphere in the, as we saw in the convoy and also in our, in our car. What we didn't know at that stage was whether it was going to end violently or not. I mean, you could still expect on the basis of previous form that it could. Um, and there was a line in the commentary of the film of um, that uh, there's so many people were there that they had to back off. And I think that's a pattern that we've seen again and again. There was an important moment in East Germany, for example, a decade earlier in Leipzig, a moment where the decision had been made to shoot, but in the end, people knowing the decision had been made to shoot still said, we're going to go out there. And the very fact that courage was there made the the regime, the authorities, the decision makers deciding whether to pull the trigger or not backed off from what it would mean and that yes, was a but, very, very important But point. as you said, you could never be sure and you could never be sure that this was going to be the moment because you had both been there, we'd all been there at times when you thought this has to be it, yet somehow Milosevic snatched victory from the jaws of defeat, not, not least yeah, no. defeat Absolutely. in war. I mean, were, were either of you just, did you just feel this has to be it now? Well, I left three days before that happened and I had been there for a month before that and uh, <laughs> when I went, the thing about journalists, we all do the same thing, we all go back to the Milosevic's hometown to see what the mood is there and when I got back, his son and his wife had just left and they said he'd gone to Russia, they'd gone to Moscow. I mean, they had cleared out and we didn't know exactly where he'd gone and that was the rumour that was going around the time, the sense that they were, they were slightly 
they were being abandoned. Um, and so that, that was three days before. And I, I think even three days before, there was a sense that we didn't, we didn't really know if it was going to happen. But what I find most fascinating about that is looking at that, the digger man and the, the drums, that in comparison to what's happening now in Iran, there was a group called Otpor who were involved, and this was a group mainly of students that the Americans adopted. And they said, how do you organize a revolution here? How do you organize a peaceful revolution? And basically, you take bunches of students to Bucharest, you take them out of, the, out of town, you set up seminars, you show them how to run the internet, you show them how to use the internet. It was America getting involved in a war to overthrow Milosevic that was incredibly calculated. So I don't think, looking at it now, how did all those diggers turn up at that time with the students? Who coordinated? It. Now, you followed it much more than I have, Norma, but it was really interesting. The stories that we were doing then was, how is this revolution going to happen? And I think that is the terrible tragedy of Iran now, because one of the things somebody said to me really recently, that, you know, when they went out in the streets, there's an extraordinary piece of video where they corner the besiege under a bridge and they hold him, and then the people don't know what to do with the besiege, the military, because there's no plan, because nobody's really bothered coordinating Iran. They're not involved the way they are in Serbia. So in a way, I look at that in sadness and I say one of the things about the legacy is we didn't learn how well that worked mm, and how we could use were, it again. There were various parts of it. There were the students and the students won the election and it was they got 57% of the vote and Milosevic set out to steal it. And that's what happened in Iran. But there was also a group of five opposition politicians who were determined to use violence if they had to, to win. Mm. And they made this plan of going to the, going for the parliament, going for the um, television station uh, and if they weren't behind it prepared to use violence I think Milosevic could have stolen it just the way it did in Iran. But how do, important uh, do you think our oh, poor war what that that kind of involvement that tra uh, training the students. Started it, but yeah. I, you're right Artpour got it to the level where the green movement got in Iran and the regime could have still still stolen it yeah. but the determination of the of the five opposition leaders to use violence if they had to and then actually in the end it also took the Russians I mean uh, Lavrov turns up in uh, it's not Lavrov it was Ivanov the f uh, Russian foreign minister turns up in Belgrade and it's he who makes Milosevic go mm -hmm. so it, it takes popular movement, yeah. determined opposition, and a bit of help from your uh, strong client. Uh, Alan, wh why didn't he go before? Why, why, why October the 5th, 2000, and not October the 5th? Yeah, this is not the first time there was a, a popular <laughs> uprising against him. There were other important differences, and uh, Norma's just touched on it. And it reminds me a bit of 1989. Uh, why did communism fall so decisively in the states of Eastern Europe? It wasn't just because it was a popular uprising against communism, it was because the Soviet Union had changed. And the Soviet Union had decided to let them go. And that was communicated to East Europe's communist leaders. There was a relationship with Russia. The Russians said to Milosevic, you're finished. And Milosevic tried to get General Pavlovich, and I think this is in your film, Norma, mm -hmm. to get the tanks on the street. And Pavlovich said, it's over. It's one thing to put tanks on the streets of Kosovo and fight the enemies of Serbia. It's a different thing to put tanks on the streets of Serbia against Serbs. And that relationship broke down. And so, for all that we give credit to the drummer boy and the, and the digger man, and they played important parts, behind the scenes there were fundamental shifts in, in, in the power relationship and the spread of power going on. That the rug had very, been very, pulled from under his feet a long pulled, time. And he didn't see it coming. And he didn't get out when he still could. He made the mistake that Ceausescu made in 1989. He didn't believe in anything except his own invincibility. And he could have gone to Russia. And well, he missed the opportunity. Um, There's one other thing to say, Bill, mm -hmm. about that. We see all that. What I got there, I was in Botswana when this was happening. <laughs> <laughs> wrong place, wrong Talk time. Talk about being the wrong, <laughs> Mr. Wrong Country. <laughs> I was in Botswana, I had to get back to Johannesburg, get on a flight to Munich and get go down to Montenegro. And, then, and so I got there about 36 hours later. And one of the things that struck me about the jubil jubilant crowds, even the most liberal and westernized of the students in Otpor, were not willing to engage in a conversation about the wars that Milosevic had fought mm -hmm. against his neighbors. They didn't see that those wars had anything to do with him. What they wanted him punished for that were the crimes committed, not against Croats and Bosnians and Albanians, but crimes committed by him against them. Electoral fraud, criminalizing the Serbian economy, destroying their savings, and so on. They didn't want to listen to stories about acts of atrocity that had been committed in neighboring countries in their name. And it was a reminder to me of something very important about Milosevic and his power base, that Serbian public opinion walked hand in hand with him for 10 years. 
and he was he stayed in power for 10 years longer than every other communist leader in Europe every other communist leader in Europe was swept away in 89 or shortly afterwards Milosevic alone stayed in power and he did that because he tapped into something deeply entrenched in Serbian sensibility and I, I, I and I was surprised by how tenacious that was and how how universal that view was and I met one one very prominent I knew one very prominent um, and very westernized very liberal journalist in in Belgrade and I was talking to her and she was infuriated by my suggestion that the war in Bosnia had had anything to do with Milosevic and uh, when I suggested that he might end up in The Hague, she said she would go to the barricades herself. Even though she'd been a passionate opponent of Milosevic, she would go to the barricades herself to prevent that happening. And what's quite revealing about that is what are the crowd chanting? Are they chanting democracy, democracy? No, they're chanting Serbia, Serbia, Serbia. Mm. And so let's not be fooled or let's not be un under any illusions about what this crowd was after, what, what, what this angry popular uprising, what its, what its aims were and what its frame of reference was. I think. Can I just Can I, briefly yeah. ask, uh, do we have anyone from Belgrade here or anyone who was, who was yes. there at the time? Just, just or, your excuse own... Excuse me, I have to vehemently disagree because I don't know a single person amongst mine. Of course, I mean, I don't want to diminish what you said whatsoever. I know you're a very acclaimed journalist, but I do not know a single person within my circle of acquaintances and friends and people I know who was in favor of Milosevic, who supported him, who didn't recognize the atrocities that he had committed in other parts of the former Yugoslavia. Mm. So to say that Serbs in general were in favor of Milosevic and that public opinion was in, in, in tune with that, I think is, 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 is misleading. I, I, I don't agree with that because I do not know people who endorsed his policies. And I don't, uh, and, and, and equally, I don't know people who endorsed, you know, the, the ethnic cleansing against Albanians in Kosovo as one who felt that that was a good strategy to go about, you know. Um, and and, and then perhaps, and just quickly, I mean, why didn't we hear any chance about democracy? Why was it Serbia? Serbia, I think one perhaps key aspect that you forgot to mention was that it wasn't put into historical context. I mean, in 98, you know, oh, sorry, 99, early 99, Serbia had been bombed by NATO, right? I mean, so perhaps there was a sense that, you know, we were being kind of targeted quite viciously, and perhaps people felt that, you know, they had been the culprits or seen or the scapegoats of that war, and perhaps that's why you heard those chants of Serbia, mm. you know, as sort of as you because they were the pariahs really of the international community at the time, mm. and perhaps that's why we heard chants of Serbia, and not democracy, as yes. I agree should have happened. Mm. But you know, I think it should perhaps be put into historical and political context as well as you know that the year previous to that there had been a bombing. Stephen, but I, I think to yes, sort of back, yeah. uh, not that I want to be sort of, I hear what you're saying and I think a lot of, for a lot of Serbs, the, 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 it's a very painful association. But one thing that struck me in 99, I was there when Bel Belgrade was bombed and, and going into the shelters and where people were there and people were terrified and shocked and this civilised world is bombing us. And um, the fear of, you know, a mother in a shelter is in Belgrade is the same as in, in Sarajevo. People are frightened for themselves and their children. But one thing I couldn't get from any of them was any sense of empathy from what it was like to be in, in Sarajevo between 92 and 95. And I asked that question because they didn't really want to know. I, I, and I really sort of put that question over three nights of bombing and it was awful. But nobody said, I really understand how they felt. Yeah, but there are so many Bosnian refugees <coughs> living in Serbia today who are Serbs, ethnically Serb, and they've come to Belgrade or to Serbia to live there as a result of the war, and they have their stories to tell, and I think there's a lot of empathy for what happened to their neighbors and family members, because, you know, believe it or not, many of them did consider themselves as Yugoslav, actually. Can I, I think say there, is, there is still a very strong sense amongst many Bosnians that I know that of, of their Yugoslav identity, which had been taken away from them quite brutally. I suppose that the, the, the sense that we all got, perhaps, in, yeah. in Belgrade was that er, the Serbs that we talked to told us that really everything was being done to them, yeah. uh, that they were not responsible for anything that clearly President Milosevic was, was, I, was doing to his neighbours. Yeah. Can I say implausibly, perhaps, but I kind of, I think actually both sides of, of this are, 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 I, I agree with. I mean, I think that the sense of denial, I have to say, was very, very widespread. And it was very striking for any visitor, especially one as you went around the war zones and then you would go across into places where they never faced any danger but were in complete denial of something which could be, you know, Vukovar was like an hour and a half up the road, Sarajevo, when you were still able to travel or even if you were coming different ways. The sense of denial was very, very striking. Um, 
amongst a large number. And I think Milosevic did steal elections, but the weird thing was that many of us confronted was that he didn't need to steal as much as he did. So I think that bit is true. But taking your point, I would come back to, uh, uh, Alan was saying about the, the, the Otport. I have to say my view is much more sympathetic. You are right that, of course, for many different reasons, you know, that wasn't necessarily the kind of, it wasn't as simple as being in Wenceslas Square in Prague in 1989 or something, where it was just about, let us rejoin Europe. It was much more complicated. But actually, I feel, what I wanted to pick up on the Otpor idea and the students and what they were doing, they were the absolute heroes for me of what there was. The politicians, Serbia has been badly, badly served by its politicians. Badly served by Milosevic, most obviously, and, and Radovan Karadzic and, and all these others, the Bosnian Serb leader. But actually, the opposition leaders had, I mean, the Otpor students had more dignity and more credibility and more moral understanding in their little fingers than all of those opposition, sorry, there was one exception actually, but all of the main opposition politicians at that time. Who in, were all terribly discredited today. Sorry? Who were all terribly discredited today. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And so in the 96, 19, and that was one important reason why I think things didn't move forward in 96, 97, mm -hmm. that you had these people who fundamentally you could see were basically more about their ego than achieving some kind of democracy and also with a kind of whereas Otpor it seems to me although I, I agree with Alan that you could certainly hear stuff that was kind of not you know Mr. or Ms. Perfect Liberal but I do feel that there was a uh, a genuine desire for change. And there were some events there. Of course, I was there was a genuine desire for change. Sorry, I beg your pardon. What, what I'm talking uh, about I, I, is I, the I willingness mean, to face up to, to, to history. The willingness no, to face up to things sorry, that were done in the name of the Serbian people. Yeah, yeah, no, but and including I, I didn't encounter any evidence of it on a wide... Of course, I, I very much respect your, your view, and we come from different... You come from Serbia, and I don't. And I, I understand that we're going to disagree about this. But my experience was, and I was there a long time, my experience was there was a very entrenched refusal to engage with the question of what had happened in Croatia and Bosnia. It wasn't that the, 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 they condoned the ethnic cleansing. They just thought it was nothing to do with them. What, why are you asking me but about this? But as you know, there were journalists who took a different line. I mean, Radio B92, Vrema magazine. I mean, there were many journalists. There was a thread. The problem was, it always depressed me, that a magazine like Vrema, which fundamentally was able to speak some of those truths, and in other more totalitarian or more conventionally authoritarian, totalitarian East European countries, you'd never been allowed to buy those things because they mm. criticise. The trouble was in Belgrade, those magazines lay unread in the mm. kiosks. Except by a small number of people. Except yeah. by a small number of yeah. people, exactly. So there was that thread, you're right, but I mean, it, it, it was small. It was mm. too small. And and state television was pumping out something state completely different. State television was coming out. Can I spring on... Yes. yes, that's right. Yeah, I mentioned yeah. the United yeah. yeah. Just the other gentleman who put his hand up when I asked is gentleman in the third row. Uh, yeah, I, I want oh, to... Uh, it's okay, I, my voice is probably loud enough. Uh, <laughs> Just for the recording. Yeah, I, I worked in um, Kosovo from 98 to uh, 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 early 2001. I, I, my ex-wife was also from the region. She was Macedonian who lived in Belgrade. And pretty much my experiences were, were like exactly what Alan said. There was a fundamental um, resistance to engage in the question of genocide. Uh, and if you even spoke the word genocide, it would be how dare you, or it didn't happen. Uh, but the point is, in the same way as there was a small minority of newspapers that questioned it in Serbia, and it wasn't popular, we had a similar phenomenon in the UK, in that the lies of um, it being a civil war, where all sides were equally to blame, all of that was perpetrated, uh, and it was fundamentally false. And it's only now that we realise that, oh, hold on, there was a minority with all the graves being dug up, obviously since the revolution. But at the time, and I remember going on demos and speaking to journalists from the BBC, and they were completely uh, uh, you know, shocked by the failure of their bosses to allow them to raise the question of what's exactly happening on the ground. And, and there was a, a strong systematic failure um, uh, uh, I think by mainstream journalism barring the independent to properly question uh, why it was um, our government, wh why Major said if we lift the arms embargo and allow the Bosnians to defend themselves, my government will fall apart. That's still a question we have no idea the answer to. And, it, and it's, it's, it's shocking that not Milosevic, a tiny tin pot and relatively powerless 
dictator was able to stay in power, but how he was actually succoured and, and um, uh, remained in power partly due to our foreign policy. I, I, I am, of course, a neutral, but I would just take issue with one thing you said. I mean, I think Martin Bell for the BBC strained the limits of objective journalism and, and fully admits that he did by some of the things he said. He was absolutely passionate to breaking point about what was being done and I would say challenged people at the BBC all the time. But since Alan uh, is and was at the BBC, maybe it's up to you to yeah, defend uh, the corporation. Course, of course I'm going to defend BBC bosses. I would <coughs> go to the barricades for BBC bosses, especially in the current climate. <laughs> um, look, there was a tension. There was, there was always a tension in journalism between people who go and people who stay between the people who lived their lives in the, in, the, in the war zone and the people whose job it is to stay in London and put the news out on the television and on the radio. There was a tension between us. Uh, the people who stayed in London tended to see it through the, from, the point, from the world view of the diplomatic circuit. And that was a world in which the all sides are equally guilty <laughs> argument was very prevalent. Uh, the all sides are equally guilty argument was very useful because it absolved the, Britain and France in particular of responsibility to act. And so those of us on the ground tended to be arguing that the humanitarian intervention uh, was prolonging the war without changing its outcome. That all sides were not equally guilty. That although atrocities were committed on all sides, the primary responsibility for the war was coming from one side. And we were saying that very clearly, very strongly, and very explicitly. And I believe objectively, with great objectivity. Um, and to say that it's only now that we're understanding the atrocities. You know, I can show you a, a huge file of pieces by Maggie and the Guardian, which were revealing the atrocities at the time, within days of them being committed. Um, I can show you some of my old radio scripts. So we knew. And when Srebrenica fell the first time in 1993 and was saved by the UN Safe Areas Resolution, which was a terrible betrayal, saved for two years, um, I wrote a piece for BBC Radio saying the people of Srebrenica have been disarmed. They're still under siege. There's an intense international focus on it at the moment. But when that fo international focus disappears, one day Srebrenica is going to fall. And what will happen, because there's a pattern, what will happen is that the men will be separated into two, two groups. Now, even I didn't think they were all going to be killed. The men will be separated into two groups, those who are considered not guilty and those who are considered guilty of war crimes. And the hundreds who are considered guilty of war crimes will be taken into a field and shot. And I, so I, I wrote in this piece, and when it happens, let none of us say we never knew. Let none of us say we never knew it was going to happen. So it was there. The reporting was there. Uh, and there were lots of us doing this at the time. And the, I can show the, you that the, script. The other point that you raise is about British foreign policy. And I, I, I think many of us remember, um, I think it was Douglas Hurd. I seem to remember him on many, many occasions <coughs> talking about centuries old ethnic hatreds. And coming from Northern Ireland, I remember when he was Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, he said exactly the same yeah. about Ireland. Um, Norma uh, was responsible for the death of Yugoslavia. Uh, sorry, the, the, the series. <laughs> the series. We thought it was Milosevic, but actually. <laughs> but actually, I think as Alan has pointed out, it, it, it did have an impact. I wonder, Norma, if you have a view on what changed. Why did the Foreign Office, for want of a better word, or the government, why did opinions change about Milosevic? I'm sure your series had a lot to do with it, but have you any mm, broader view I, of I oh, doubt it. One series are never, uh, are never particularly influential. But, it, but I, I, uh, I suppose yeah. it provided the evidence. But, uh, yeah. uh, if, but the, I mean, the person, when we were making the death of Yugoslavia, it was during the Bosnian War, um, and we were trying to get Milosevic, and it was very hard to get Milosevic because by then he thought all Western journalists were going to accuse him of being a war criminal, and why should he be in a BBC ser series? Um, and we had everyone working for us. We had his wife working for us. His wife and I got on really well because I was an old Labour Party hack and she was an old Communist Party 
person. More and, of that later. Yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> and um, so, so she was, I mean, every week we would call his wife and she would say, ah, oh, well, I tried, but it's like going to the dentist. He won't do it. And the person who persuaded him to be in the film was a combination of the British ambassador to Serbia and David Owen, who was then the peace negotiator, um, who at that time saw a lot of Milosevic and he listened to them and they were great mates. And so there was a time, this is, I guess, 90. 94, mm. late 94, that um, he was very respectable, well, statesman mm -hmm. at that point. They were trying to do a peace deal with him. So, um, what, 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 what changed their opinion? I mean? It just got too bad later on. Um, so. It got too bad. And um, the Americans helped. I mean, Madeleine Albright was always absolutely there. And when Bill Clinton stopped, having to worry about his own little domestic difficulties and could be interested in foreign policy again, um, he stepped in. And it was, it was um, the American bombing that um, uh, ended the Bosnian War. It was and brought him to the, to the peace talks in Dayton. Um, but, you know, the, the ethnic cleansing in Kosovo became something that the world couldn't uh, we, we may We may hate the yeah. government that just gone in, in retrospect and my own personal relationship with Robin Cook was quite difficult but it has to be said that 1997 and the arrival of Robin Cook as Foreign Secretary because, I mean that was significant and the ethical, and the ethical, ethical problem was, foreign there was a significant sense that he and some of the people around him understood the degree of the failures including what Alan has laid out the Srebrenica massacre and the utter utter failure and I think that there was a kind of wake up to some extent that they arrived certainly they arrived he arrived personally to some extent the government but he arrived personally with a very very clear agenda for, because what had happened after 95 including when there were indict quote indictments against many of the people responsible some of the worst crimes and at that stage the NATO troops who were there would blithely walk past um, people who were indicted war criminals they didn't want to go there at all and that significantly changed with, with Robin Cook's arrival, with the, with the new government said, we need to kind of change things on here. Holbrook. Just going back, especially since the independent, which I used to work for, was let off the hook in your intervention, coming back to that, I, I do think, I mean, actually, journalists have a lot to be proud of more generally, I think, for the reasons that you've heard. They did work, I think, and the independent, in as much as there were difficulties, frankly, they were just as great at the independent as anywhere else, which were, you were trying to get something prominently or on the front page saying this matters and they were kind of like oh haven't we heard all this before and one knew as a, a writer that if it was there more prominently then you know maybe you could make a uh, make a difference to things um, and and a number of editors in London were a bit bored but in general terms I think that work with Maggie and Alan and many many others journalists could hold their heads high and the ones who couldn't were the politicians who were absolutely refusing. In, in, in the, the title of the um, work by the historian Brendan Sims, this was indeed Britain's unfinest hour. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a brilliant title, but also it's a savagely <coughs> brilliant book. I thought I kind of knew the stuff and didn't need to read it. When I read the book, my jaw dropped at understanding the detail, mm. the detail of the turning away by men who believed that they were behaving morally, who believed that somehow because of all this stuff they'd read too many history books with too little fundamental understanding of what that really meant for the modern age. And I think there's a lot of lessons for us there. That complacency that said, oh, well, you people can get very excited about this, but we have a rather greater understanding and we are more moderate in understanding. And it was a real absolute lack of humanity, I think, that, but that this failed is, this very badly. Brendan Sims' book is about the major government, um, the John Major government yeah. in Bosnia. Yeah. Um, because it's not only Robin Cook, the other person's finest hour, hour is Tony Blair. I mean, Tony, right. yeah. Tony Blair on Kosovo was 100% right and stood out against the Tony bands who were saying, actually, since you started the bombing, it's all got worse and the ethnic cleansing has got worse. It's in the film. Oh. Um, uh, but the problem is it went to his head, and he thought when he was right about Kosovo and everybody else was against him, uh, when the same thing happened in Iraq, he persisted yeah. because he was right about Kosovo. And, and that's another story. Yeah. Uh, I remember standing at Ratchak, this small village, um, in front of the trench which contained the bodies of nearly, in the trench that were nearly 30 Albanians. And there had been massacres before, but I remember thinking, this is it, because this was all the evidence that anyone required at that. It, for me, that was, that was the tipping point. And I know when I said, what changed, you immediately said yeah. Kosovo. I mean, yeah. is it? 
Kosovo, 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 those mechanisms were indeed used again by the Americans, not just in Serbia, but uh, in Ukraine during the Orange Revolution and Georgia during the Orange Revolution. Of course, it has its limitations, so it can't be used in Iran, let's say, effectively. Um, regarding the documentaries, I think the first documentary, The Death of Yugoslavia, is quite objective. It's very effective. It tells the story very well. The second documentary, The Fall of Milosevic, I think has a tendency to over romanticize some of the people we saw in the film there, like Velimir Ilic, who has remained, a, a, has been a mainstay in Serbian politics since the so called revolution of uh, October 2000. Uh, and people like Vojislav Koshkunica, for example. Koshkunica is painted in the film as somebody who is some, a person the West can do business with. Now, ideologically speaking, Koshkunica turned out to be more of a nationalist in many ways than Milosevic. Do you think there was a tendency in the film perhaps to overlook some of the very real problems that existed within DOS, or some of the problems with the personalities themselves. But we always try and rule out hindsight, and I think you're looking at the film with hindsight. I mean, that was their finest hour. Kostanica was a nationalist when they chose him. They chose him because he was a nationalist, because he appeals to all these people that Alan's been talking about. Otherwise, they wouldn't have voted for him. He was an honest nationalist. Um, the fact that many of them went wrong afterwards um, is not something that really is material to what's happening on the 5th of October. But the person one ought to hear about this, I think, is Tika Meloza, who's standing in the back, um, who, who was my brains uh, <laughs> when we were making the film. Uh, do you think that we romanticized the opposition politicians who've um, <laughs> become a bit tarnished in the last decade? Well, thanks uh, so much. Uh, um, I don't think so. Uh, I think one thing to... Uh, consider uh, when it comes to mechanics of bringing Milosevic down uh, is that it was a very remotely true people who actually uh, came after him uh, uh, and the history of it is that I think uh, uh, the, uh, uh, um, during the 13 years of Milosevic's rule there was hardly ever any clear line uh, between opposition and the regime the people walked in and out of love with, uh, with the regime. <coughs> so inevitably, when it came to bringing him down, uh, the coalition included some people who have been with Milosevic. Uh, people like Chovic, like Perisic, like uh, Mihailovic, and also some people who saw the writing on the wall in the uh, 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 sort of last minute, people like Legia or Pavkovic, uh, that's why it worked. Um, don't think uh, it was really our job uh, at that time in 2000 and 2001 uh, to sort of go through ideological hair splitting. Uh, the job was simply to tell the story how it worked. Uh, and as Norma said, I think uh, uh, big part of the reason why it worked with Kustunica and why it probably would have never worked with Jinjic in mm. the front row but they, okay, was but they that were, he, they were he a good was partnership. nationalist and mm. pretty sort of unknown. I mean, he, was, he, was, uh, he was a blank sheet of paper, so he was just projected by, uh, by the coalition as a, as a sort of frontman for this, for this enterprise of bringing Milosevic down. Kostanica was a Serb and a nationalist and the sort of person who Serbs could identify with, but he was an honest man and therefore in big contrast to Milosevic. But Djindic was the brains and I think the big might have been um, was unfortunately Djindic was shot um, three months later. Um, and um, Three years later? No. They oh, shot three, in 2003, yeah. yeah. It was yeah. three months after my program went out. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, three years later. And by one of the, one of the former Milosevic thugs who had actually helped the revolution on that day, 
but, um, but Legia, killed him. Yeah. But he was the kind of clever politician who might have pulled it off later, who was gone. If I, if I may just add, there is a piece in the film where Gingich describes meeting Legia. He's picked up by him in a car in Belgrade. And Legia was well known as a bodyguard of Arkan, as a person who was on the scene in Belgrade for many, many years. It's, I think, unfathomable that Gingich would not have known who Legia was. And this uh, idea, or that what was projected in the film, was that, um, uh, because I, I think Gingich says, well, when I met him for the first time, he seemed, uh, he was tall, he was a sporty type. It was implied oh, that the two knew. had never met, and I, I, or, or seen each other, and I, I find that, frankly, highly unlikely. He knew he was a thug. He said, his wife said, you might not come back from this meeting. Yeah, but um, I, I find it hard to believe that the two men would not have been more connected than was implied in the film. That's my... Why, why is that? Well, I mean, it's quite possible. One is Milosevic's guy, the other is opposition leader. Yeah, Why exactly. do you think that but they had to meet somewhere? Somewhere? But, you know, Belgrade and the political scene of Belgrade, it's a relatively it's small... It's a single political scene. scene. It's a single you political scene. Position, he would have been known around Belgrade, almost certainly, by, by Gingit, by Kostunica, by, by all of these guys. I just, I mean, my question was, do you think you were romanticized? Given that the conversation is about where have we come in the last 10 years? And I think that um, perhaps there was a tendency to do that, that we we never addressed. And as Stephen would rightly pointed out, it wasn't the journalist's job to split hairs ideologically at the time. But was it well understood by you, the character of DOS, do you think? Um, and maybe other journalists were willing to overlook yeah. certain flaws. That was it. But ultimately, in a way, you know, there's a certain pragmatism in revolution. And if you look, again, I'm sort of thinking about Iran, but, you know, Karubi and Musavi and all the people who represent the opposition, yeah. in terms of is Islamic fundamentalism and their involvement in the purges, and, you know, their, their hands are covered in blood, but enemies, enemies and friends, and do we move on if they're the way through? Yeah. It's a question of pragmatism, yeah. I think. Musavi was the prime minister more in favour of continuing the Iran-Iraq war than anyone yes. else. Mm. Uh, but yeah. doesn't. But but he he still did the right thing. In it's last true year. again and again. I think that change you need to judge simply by what comes next. And clearly, what came after the fall of Milosevic, in the most immediate sense, the fact he was no longer there. I mean, if he'd stayed, the likelihood of the next war, which would have been Montenegro, was very high. I mean, Montenegro was expecting that war. We can assume that if Milosevic had stayed in power, but needing to cling, he needed more nationalism, which was building up. I mean, to a certain point, that is the good news. The bad news, which has already been flagged, is that things haven't moved forward, that Serbia itself, that the, the reluctance to confront the degree of what had happened before is still, is still, I mean, I haven't been back recently, but certainly talking to friends who have and, and just looking what there is, there's still a reluctance to confront. But again, even this, you can, you know, you can talk in terms of the glass being half full or half empty, because it takes time. Mm -hmm. Just to push it forward, because the next day, <clears throat> October the 6th, 2000, Kostanica said, we are moving towards a new future with France, Greece, which is interesting, and <laughs> Norway. He may be relieved that he's not in the same position as Greece now, but he said Serbia is today, October the 6th, 2000, a part of Europe. But of course, in one sense, in one sense it is, in one sense uh, it's not. Uh, the its European Union future is, is, is still um, at issue. Um, if we assume something went wrong in Serbia in the last 10 years, what did and why? Actually. Um, uh, that's a very interesting point that you have raised, and thank you for that. I think um, what went wrong is that there was no um, collective responsibility on behalf of the government uh, of Serbia to admit that the genocide took place in Srebrenica, as the International Court of Justice found. And only recently the resolution has been passed in the Serbian parliament about the crime in Srebrenica, and they have apologized to the victims. <coughs> Um, or to the families of the victims, uh, but they have still not called that crime by its real name, which is genocide. And until the Serbia shows that real democratic face and um, admit what had happened and sincerely apologize on behalf of the government of, or the previous regime, there would not be um, a clear and honest sort of um, future or, or um, reconciliation in the region and um, they, they would not be really I think fully or, or, or open-handedly accepted into the European Union so in that respect there needs to be a collective 
responsibility and obviously all, all the war criminals brought to justice, including Mladic, which probably they know where he is. Can, I, can, can I just respond? Sure. I mean, yep. I, I have some sympathy for reforming Serb, uh, Serb politicians, people trying to move the country on in the aftermath of Milosevic. And to retrospectively say that they should have, the <coughs> Serbian leaders should have said right openly right at the start, well, we recognize the crimes that were committed and all of that, is I think to misunderstand the nature of Serbian public opinion. They would, have, by doing so, they would in that atmosphere at that time have, have uh, relegated themselves to the absolute margin, lunatic fringe of Serbian political life. And I think what they were trying to do was change the political climate, change the nature of the discourse, and, and I don't really include Kostunic in this, but uh, others, Jinjic certainly. And I think what really went wrong in Serbia after Milosevic was the assassination of Jinjic. Mm. Everything was on hold then until 2008, and that very tense election of 2008 when Tadic just won. And it coincided, if you remember, the timing of it with the Declaration of Independence by Kosovo. Now, that was Serbia, in a sense, deciding whether it was going to go down the European route or into this cul-de-sac of more nationalism. But between 2003 and 2008, there was a wasted half decade. And that's the tragedy of the last 10 years, that the guts of that decade were wasted between the assassination of Jinjic when it all unraveled and the 2008 election when it started gingerly. And the problem is, if you're going to change Serbia, you have to bring public opinion with you. And to have said right at the start, we committed genocide. You're finished in Serbian well, politics. Well, we could have said it at the start, but now with Tadic, with the new fresh face of Serbia, who uh, who is a character who is portraying, this, you know, who wants to take Serbia f uh, forward and take them into the European Union and turn that cha Milosevic's chapter sure. and apologize, and he has uh, obviously attended um, uh, two anniversaries in Srebrenica on a personal level, but there was n nothing on formal governmental level. So people were hoping that the resolution that they were talking about would have really called the crime a genocide and apologized for it, which would have given a real chance for the reconciliation and, and moving forward and obviously hopefully bringing the ethnic divisions in Bosnia down and, and uh, bringing, bringing the whole region into the U European Union and having a brighter future for, for the younger generations. Yeah. But that didn't happen. Well, can and I just briefly, were, just uh, very briefly, sure. I'm going to leap to the defense of Serbia, which <laughs> Serbian people in the audience might think is rather unusual for me. But <laughs> Serbia has done a lot in the, last, in, in the last 15 years to get to grips with this. There are now Serbian domestic war crimes tribunals, Serbian prosecutors and Serbian judges but trying Serbian... Well, there, 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 there are Serb war criminals on trial and who have been convicted and sentenced. It's a start, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yes, so but it's not enough. OK, it's just, just, just a quick comment from Stephen, then yeah, I'd like to yeah. take the, the gentleman here, and there's a gentleman at the back as well. I just Stephen. wanted to echo about what Alan was saying, both <coughs> from my personal perspective, but also wearing a partly Amnesty International perspective. The importance of accountability is hugely important. But actually, the fact that it is moving, so it's, it's again, as I said earlier, it's a half full or half empty. I mean, I think we do need to recognize moving forward there are tribunals where prosecutions are taking place, and that's very important. The other thing, the scale of crime, crimes, obviously, is different between Germany and the Balkans to a massive degree. But I think it is very interesting to note in terms of public opinion, Willy Brandt, one of the most noble Germans, he could barely speak what he, of course, felt in a way that would have influence in Germany till 25 years after the end of the Second World War. And that process in Germany took another 25 years and then another 10 on top of that to change. And clearly, I'm not suggesting that the, the, you know, the, the, we're talking very different problems, but I think one needs to see the gradual. I'm, I'm encouraged by the fact that there are some changes, clearly, both personally but also wearing an Amnesty International hat, would want more to be happening. But I think it's a matter of encouraging those people who do want it. And people like Natasha Kandic, for example, a brave, brave Serb woman who founded the Humanitarian Law Centre in Belgrade, who spoke at at the time of the atrocities, she continues to get many threats, including death threats, for speaking yeah. out. Yeah. That's the kind of thing that needs to yes. end. Gentleman in the second row. Yes, uh, thank you. If I could just uh, identify myself as a native of the only capital in the world, in fact, that has been bombed by both NATO and the Nazis. So at least you know which uh, angle I'm coming from. Uh, you can speak about your objectivity, but you know the United Kingdom has now been at war with another country in Europe for the first time since May 1945. You cannot be neutral if you're a war participant. Not a single institution in the United Kingdom can be neutral where Serbia and the Serbian people are concerned. Individually you can, yes, but then you have to go against your own institution. 
this business of war crimes, uh, you know, putting a kind of microphone against uh, some people in Belgrade who are not confronting things. Don't we have a war crimes tribunal that has been operating for 16 years now? It started in uh, 1994, October. Haven't you had Milosevic there? Don't you have Karadzic there? Are they not answering your questions? Are you not satisfied with them? Well, I am not satisfied with what you are doing. Let me put you straight away. I've been in touch with Mr. Milosevic's defense team. In 2004, I actually saw Mr. Milosevic in prison. You might ask, what is an innocent man doing in a prison? Because he has to be treated as innocent until a verdict is actually passed. Right, so you're prisoner number 39, there is something wrong, accused number 39 is okay. Now, how does the situation occur here in the United Kingdom? The normal justice procedure, this is what Amnesty International tells us, you know, you have to stand up to justice and all this. The justice procedure consists of three phases. We hear out the prosecution, we then hear out the defense, whereby it's vital that the defense gets at least the same time as the prosecution, because it's much easier to claim and blame than to defend against it. And the third phase, obviously, is an independent set of judges and jury who bring a verdict. In the United Kingdom, for the last, here in London, a world media center, not once have I heard an institution which has asked for the defense view to be heard. But I heard <coughs> Judge Richard Goldstone, the chief prosecutor of the tribunal, at the Royal Institute of Foreign Affairs, I've heard him at the LSE, I've heard Louis Arbo, Chief Prosecutor, I've heard uh, uh, Richard Goldstone, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, uh, Jeffrey. Sir Jeffrey Nice, he's a sir now, again right-hand man of the prosecution. The BBC, Mr. Little, is the right-hand man of the prosecution, so is CNN. Not once, really not once in 16 years have I heard uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, a, a, a case for the defense being stated. You know what you're doing? When the prosecution asks for justice, and only they ask for justice, that's a dictionary definition of a lynch. And that is what you have been doing for the last 16 years. Bravo. I wouldn't want an Englishman to be as much as a referee at a football match in which Serbia plays. And the last thing, haven't we heard this business of genocide? Hasn't the International uh, 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 Court of Justice declared Serbia as innocent of the crime of genocide? Have you just forgotten that? They specifically, there were lots of cases and they declared them as innocent. Sorry, but this is the whole bit. All of you have been on the side of the prosecution. Why do you think we have been Sorry. Well, I, I, I remember when I reported from the War Crimes Tribunal having people say almost precisely what I remember one person saying this is Alice in Wonderland justice. It's verdict first, now let's hear the evidence. They felt that M M Milosevic was, was guilty simply because he was, he was exactly. there. So exactly. I, uh, I, I know where you're coming from, and it's not just Belgrade. And, and I would say, you know, we try desperately to be whatever objective, procedure. whatever objective. We haven't heard the defence in 16 years. By yes. the way, if Frontline could allow the defence to be heard here at Frontline, I could get Mr. Men Mr. Milosevic is now dead, so you can't hear. Him. Some people think that he has been liquidated. By the way, but I'm in touch with the defence team. I could get them here. Possibly we could arrange it. You will be the first institution in Western Europe that has heard the defence case. It's partly so, so just to get that situation clear. It, it just Trust Lang has that opportunity. You can be unique. It's partly Milosevic's fault. I mean, he insisted on doing his own defence, so nobody heard the defence team at the Hague Tribunal. There are people who can, there are people who can translate his messages. Just one message. Here, you've got, a, you've got a topic. Mr. Milosevic was, and his legacy, he's given you an answer to that. The same thing was presented to him at the, at the tribunal. You know what his answer was? <coughs> there has been only one war, and that has been a war against Yugoslavia and he could name all the aggressor countries that are there, right? What is the most, the, the largest military base in Europe that the United States has is now in Kosovo. They've taken over the whole thing. There is no Yugoslavia. There is a death of Yugoslavia. The West, a non-European country with 17 NATO countries in Europe have killed it, and you know it. Thank you very much. I, I would like to take, oh, the gentleman at the back and then gentleman at the front as well. <coughs>
<laughs> Just at the outset, I'd like to say that I do think there was a nationalism in Serbia, and there were nationalists, including Milosevic, and war crimes were committed, and that was wrong. But here, I've seen a tendency to start the whole story with Bosnia. There was a chapter before Bosnia, and that was the war with Croatia. And before the war with Croatia, there were certain series of events that led to the breakup of Yugoslavia. I think we have to locate the problems in these chapters, because in Croatia, you had a Serb minority in Kenin, in Kraina, that said, we will not be a part of this nationalist republic, which elected a Ustashe sympathetic government, flying the flag of the Ustashe, by the way, in power, which took away the rights of the Serbs, very similar to Kosovo in some ways, possibly worse. But yet, they were not allowed to secede. That was not allowed, right? And the cl ethnic cleansing of Serbs in Kraina with, with Operation Storm, by the way, with the Americans participating, oh, yeah. was a crime against humanity. We don't hear even 1 50th of that as much as we hear of the real crimes committed by Serb nationalists in Bosnia and in Kosovo, which must be prosecuted. But the problem arises when there is a one-sided portrayal of the war, and there isn't an adequate focus on the institutions that collapsed in Yugoslavia, that strengthened ethnic nationalism. The institutions collapsed because the EU was very hasty, I would say Germany specifically, hastily recognized Croatia against EC <coughs> advice. In fact, the EC was not for it. They were saying, let's keep this country together and work and negotiate and keep the institutions going. Once you destroy institutions of a nation, this is well known in international relations scholarship. Once the institutions collapse, then ethnic nationalism grows because people have become afraid they seek refuge in ethnic politics, and what you get is what you got on all two or three sides in Yugoslavia. So I think we have to look at that aspect. I, I know Alan was nodding his head, but this gentleman was too, and I know you wanted to make a point. Yes, I, if I may just, I, I, I don't really, I'm not really qualified to comment at all, except that my, my father and my uncle were both quite heavily involved at different stages. My um, father um, in, during the Croatian Serb War in 91 and later, and my uncle in Kosovo. <laughs> Um, but I feel very, and I have friends who have been involved in the armed forces as well. But I feel touched by it very much, but I've never been involved. But I've just be, come back from um, quite an extensive visit to Serbia and also to Macedonia and Croatia. And just in passing, I want to pay tribute to, particularly to you two, because I think way back when it was all going on, I think you were both really magnificent. I'm, I'm sure you were too, but I don't actually specifically remember you being. But I do. I remember being being very comforted in, by by the fact that at least we knew from some people what was really happening, and that you were able to talk about atrocities on all sides. And I accept your judgment, I think. But I, but there, it was on all sides that there were terrible things happening. Um, but my my point is that having just come back from these countries. Um, and, and I'm no expert at all, but I, I think the agony of Serbia at the moment is for anyone who has any eyes to see. It is a country which has been spectacularly let down by almost everybody. Not everybody, but almost everybody. And I have these various observations to make. There is no way that Serbia can make progress, I don't think, unless there is also progress in Croatia. One of the things I found very, very <laughs> difficult was the intense nationalism in Croatia, which I've, I found very, very unsettling. Um, and I also found the, curiously, the greatest peace to be found amongst old Macedonian Muslim communists who still have pictures of Tito in their shops and who have a sort of calmness about their view of the world, which is curiously reassuring. And I, that's where we really, I agree with the previous chat. And I, I, I'm a Christian, and I'm happy to be a Christian, but I, I really think that we've got to um, emphasize the future of these countries and not the past. I mean, the, the Europe has served the Balkans so ill from the Congress of Berlin through the Balkan Wars and then before the First World War, the First World War, and Bitola was raised to the ground. Everybody remembers Ypres, but nobody remembers Bitola. You know, the sort of disaster of 1941 when, when Germany bombed Belgrade. I mean, all that is forgotten, and we were, we're behind the curve all the time. We were behind the curve in 93, behind the curve in 95, behind the curve in 98. You know, all the time, uh, the West and the Russians and the Chinese are behind the curve. And 
the, it's so frustrating having just gone through service, seeing the sort of collapse of its system, of its infrastructure, of morale, cleanliness. I mean, it, and did you did you get the same? Did, did you get the sense of grievance that I think I heard yeah, from yes, you? This I, deep. Yeah, I mean, I was I was having a conversation with some Germans on Belgrade Station three days ago, and some Serbs came up to us and said, "Are you American?" And actually, they said it's the wretched German, which I, well, I mind you, a good thing they didn't know he was German. But anyway, um, and, he, and, and the German chat said, no, I'm, no, I'm not American. And, uh, but didn't we, admit we, that he was German. And, I mean, I'm actually, I felt like saying, well, actually, I'm, I'm quite a friend of America. What's your, what's your problem? You know, but I, I didn't say that because I wanted to get home. Um, <laughs> but I, and I didn't have any brief. I wasn't. I, I didn't want to have a conversation with somebody I'd never met before on the station platform. But. My, my, I'm sure that's correct, and I don't agree with you about your judgment, but I think there is something palpably wrong with sticking with the past with this, because there is no resolution of Bosnian, Serb, Croatian, uh, Muslim, um, Albanian grievances in a sort of careful lining up of corpses. I mean, it's important to be truthful, but it's not the future. Well. And, and it, I just, I, I'm afraid I feel a desperate need for money, for, for material things. I think if there's one part of the world that needs material things, not good religion, which most of us do need, it's, it's the Balkans. Money and, and know-how and level-headedness and, you know, copper wire and steel and glass and roads and, you know, sort of, Getting, rounding up the stray dogs and sorting out recycling and boring stuff that will make a huge difference to those countries. Sorry. Uh, I, I agree with you in, in essence, and that is that there is no European policy for the Balkans really. There is not yet a coherent European policy for the Balkans. And I know that Catherine Ashton, the new European foreign minister, is putting a, a, a Balkan team in place and promises uh, to turn the page on that. However, one of the my difficulties with the whole region, and especially not so much in Serbia, but in Bosnia, there is an expectation that the solution will come from the outside, and that political elites in the country do not have to be part of that. So they don't have to contribute anything to it. There is an expectation that Europe must fix it, and it won't do. It has, there has to be a political elite has to emerge in the country that will take responsibility for itself. And I think that's happening in Serbia, actually. I think it's been happening slowly and gradually, and there are others who might disagree. It's not happening in Bosnia. Mr. Dodik said today, uh, after winning the election on Sunday, Bosnia is not a state, it's never been a state, it never will be a state. It's a geographical expression on which are located several republics. Now, how's he going to fix his country if that's his view? And, uh, and so I think there's a real problem with Paddy Ashdown when he went there. He said, my ambition is to make my job redundant by repatriating political responsibility, by getting the political elites in the country to take responsibility for fixing problems themselves with outside help. Instead of which, what they do, and I'm talking about specifically about Bosnia now, what they do when they fall out with each other, they ask Europe to take their side. And there is no, so, so that, that is a problem with the political culture of Bosnia, which is a country I love and, and, and go back to again and again. I don't think it's the same problem in Serbia. I agree with you about Croatian nationalism. It's, uh, it's uh, deeply entrenched and not very attractive um, political uh, instinct, and it winds the Serbs up no end. Um, and there is, an, there is an unaddressed injustice with Operation Storm, but actually I think it's about political elites in the country saying, taking the initiative, taking the agenda, and it's for the most part not happening in Bosnia. It's only just happening in Serbia, but it happened in Croatia a long time ago. Steve. Just a, a small postscript. Yes, I mean, we hadn't spoken about it before, but clearly the Croatian crimes are very clear, and the failure to address those properly is a big issue. I mean, just allowing that to let that be. And I, I would strongly disagree. You were suggesting that, you know, it's better to let bygones be bygones. Again, coming back to my Germany comparison, that was exactly, it was interesting, it was reprinted the other day for something from the Auschwitz trial in Germany in, in the mid-60s. Quotes from Germans, uh, it was republished on, on, on the anniversary. People saying, let's leave it by. Actually, Germany gained its stability and the political health it has today only after it had begun to really confront. And that confrontation is really important. So yes, the Croatian crimes were, were absolutely very important. But the but that's really important is we need to hear that from Croats. What is unhelpful is when the other side will say, well, they lot did that lot of things and haven't confronted. And the other side will say, well, that lot did that lot of things and they haven't confronted. They're both right. 
but they should be looking into their own houses and I would agree with Alan as well it's not to do with what comes from outside from outside we can put the pressure to try and make that happen but fundamentally the politicians um, need to show the kind of moral backbone that can make the societies move forward in the way that's necessary gentleman in the middle toward the back yep <coughs> hi there thanks um, I'm just wondering there's a lot of talk about responsibility and uh, Serbs identifying with their guilt about the crimes that they've done and so on. But I'm um, just wondering, um, you as journalists know all too well about responsibility and so on, but how responsible do you feel for the reporting on the war in Iraq? I mean, do you feel empathy with the people in Iraq, given that it was proven to be a wrong war? Or where, do you, where do you stand on that? I mean, Maggie, do you want to chip in on that? Yeah, I mean, you do, know, when you, the I mean, first word that came into my mind was shame, actually, and I thought I'm, I'll have to think of how to rationalise that a bit and sort of, sort of soften it a bit. But um, I think, I think we, we've reached a stage where uh, the, one of the significant things, in a way, uh, is. I mean, this I was, is in our own house. I'm, you, you know, you said us, ourselves we should recognise, we should yeah. apologise, we should take responsibility. So. <laughs> Yeah. Not just us, but I'm, yourselves as journalists. I mean, you have a much bigger responsibility than an average Joe. I mean, <coughs> where do you stand there? Well, in terms of, you know, well, there's a political expression of what went wrong with the war, which is up to the politicians to take responsibility for that. What I'm interested in is how do we do uh, honest reporting that also, most importantly, lets people understand that they have got an honest picture. And I think the difficulties with the Iraq war and the difficulties since Bosnia, interestingly, when journalists first began to be assassinated, is that it's become incredibly dangerous to cover wars. So instead of admitting it's incredibly dangerous to cover wars and we're not sending people to cover them properly, we are attempting to give the impression that we have covered it. So it's the green zone reporting that we've had for the last three or four years. Iraq was a total disaster. The loss, the reconstruction, what's happened. And, uh, you know, we've made six, seven or eight films in Iraq. We've only been able to make them by training Iraqis to go to Fallujah, to go to these places, to get outside the, the, the green zone and try and report it. But overall, I think, you know, it's a really, it's, it's, a, it's a real wake up call for journalism because we cannot pretend we covered that war because we the only way we recovered it was by covering it diplomatically reporting what was happening in the green zone reporting that the surge was successful and it's a terrible shame I don't do think you, you would find any any journalistic organization and I know because I've chaired discussions on Iraq here before any organization that would put their hand up and say you know what we're really really proud of our work in Iraq yes there are some things to be proud of but across the Across the I, piece. I don't mean from no. the point of view of your organisation. I mean that's another subject. But I mean <coughs> personally, you five. You said the Serbian people should be responsible. They should, they should take responsibility. As, uh, I'm asking you, as as British taxpayers who've contributed to the war, who've elected Labour, Lib Dem, and Conservative, who have now been proven to, to have been wrong to go into Iraq with the whole WMD claims and so on. That is part of your profession. Do you personally feel responsible? Do you want to use this opportunity to, to accept guilt, apologise to the Iraqi people? Or? Well, uh, to be honest, this is, I, I think this is not to be, uh, it, it's not about Iraq. But if, if anyone would yeah, like to chip in, I would only say, I would only say one thing. I would only say what. To take responsibility for yeah. Their, yeah. Their no. Politicians that didn't act in no. the interest of no. the people. Can I'm I say? Because I feel very wrong by Milosevic too. But yeah. I don't. I never supported his or endorsed his policies. I hate the man, the, the man just as much as you do. But why should I, as an individual, take. Nobody's arguing that you should. Uh, no, exactly. Yeah. I Nobody think here is arguing that you should. It's no, not. No, 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 in the public discourse, it gets portrayed as such. And this is what the lady in the front row said as well, that Serbs yeah. as a collective have to take responsibility for what Milosevic did. Okay, how about... I'm fairly sure know, that that hasn't been said from here. Them. I'm fairly sure it hasn't been said from here. It is not an issue... I, did, I never voted no. for There's not an so issue... Just, 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 just one second, we just... Did not vote for Let's have one discussion rather than several. We can do this, we can do this afterwards. <coughs> certainly speaking, Sorry, pers Steve. Certainly speaking no, personally, I may not be speaking to the others. <laughs> Yes or no? Do you take responsibility as, as British journalists? Well, can I just... I wanted to answer slightly something different because it's to do with the fact of actually I don't think, certainly I personally, but I haven't heard it from others on the platform, are suggesting the responsibility needs to be taken for what happened. What does need to happen is a confrontation with the truth 
and acceptation and acceptance of the truth. That is the bottom line and that's where we start from. And that's how you then move forward is understanding and saying, okay, bad stuff happened. And that's the, that's the real the starting point for everything else, I think. And to some extent that is already happening as we've discussed, but that's what helps you, what helps move forward undoubtedly for me. I'm getting a wind up signal from the back. There was just a lady in the middle who, I, I, did you, you had your hand up at one point? Was there a point I that did, you? But I actually, I just want to um, agree with the lady. <laughs> no one, I, I don't quite understand why we should take responsibility if half the country wasn't actually supporting what was going on. So I don't know, just like no. the lady behind me, there were so many of us who were absolutely opposed to everything that was going on. And I think that was the majority. However, how he gained the minority to stand behind him, I don't know. And I certainly I have no idea. Mm. But uh, I, don't, I, I think that's, that's what happened. I don't think the majority was the behind. The I don't think we're talking about collective responsibility here. I'm just talking about in our experience, there was a, a lack of acknowledgement, I find, in Serbia with many people that I interviewed to actually acknowledge what happened. I'm not saying that was the Serbian people. I'm saying that was and I think experience. We all, and, I, and again, I'm not sure who, what's the profile of the people you've spoken to. I think a lot of people, and I, I certainly speak, I think, in the name of well, there's certainly Serbia sort of people here that live that live here. I think we um, we do take some responsibility, well, not responsibility, but we do acknowledge what happened, and we don't. I don't think anyone in their right mind can say that Srebrenica didn't happen or that well, it was the well, right that gentleman. There will well, I, say I disagree it. with that gentleman, and I'm yes. Serbian, yes. and so yes. it doesn't. I, I well, completely. You had Mr. Milosevic four and a half. And I think that's the age. two different you got arguments. The transcripts, you got everything. Yes, he not answered all that. You're coming now to ordinary people who can't do anything about it, and you're asking them now to take. Well, uh, let me let me, let me okay. Let me just let me just be, make one thing clear. I'm sorry if I've given you the responsibility that I'm blaming you <laughs> for the wars in Yugoslavia. <clears throat> that certainly was not my intention. What I was saying is that I find alarming and distressing the fact that in Serbia ten years ago there was a widespread reluctance to engage with the question of the crimes that have been committed in the name of the Serbian people in other republics. There was, a there was an almost universal reluctance to engage with that question. And I thought that was damaging for the political culture. I thought that was going to throw up the kinds of political leaders who would make things worse. Uh, that's what I was saying. I'm not asking you to take, I'm certainly not asking the Serbian nation to take collective responsibility. I'm certainly not. It's not always dangerous when that gets collectivized and then people also in, in, in the context of the ICTY start talking about there being a victim of justice and Serbia being on trial, which is not the case because individuals are on trial. Yeah. Not Serbia as a nation and I think that is very... I understand the distinction you're making but, but, but yes, and I agree with it. Can I, can I just take maybe one final point because I'm sure we can continue this uh, afterwards but in the formal discussion, <laughs> gentlemen, in, in, in the middle, yeah. Frontline member who comes here regularly to these discussions and debates and comes to understand, also somebody who's visited Bosnia four or five times in the last ten years and Croatia three times, I am deeply depressed at the statements that have been made over the course of the last 20 minutes by people who don't want to enlarge understanding but simply to repeat accusations and repeat justifications because every time former Yugoslavia is discussed it ends up by a series of counter accusations being thrown at people and I'm just really asking for the next discussion we have of this kind to concentrate on understanding rather than accusations. I, I did try to move it on at one point. I do apologize <laughs> if, I, <coughs> if I failed. Um, I'd like to thank you all, all for coming, especially those of you who come from, from Belgrade, although you may be, be, be living here. Um, I, I, I thought I'd end just with one um, quote uh, 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 someone said of Milosevic. Um, it was a Serbian poet who described him in these words. Uh, he was a little man of no particular greatness, who rose from the greyness of bureaucracy and anonymity at a time when nobody was prepared to stop him. That makes him the product of us all. And maybe actually Milosevic in his latter years, maybe in his best years, was a product of all of us in the West as well as those mm. in Yugoslavia. Thank you very much. Uh, for coming tonight. I'd also like to thank our four panelists. I hope it's been stimulating.